and then we made the baseball cards like this month, like. And uh, it's funny because they got all these funny stats. On I was going to ask about the stats. What are the stats looking like, oh, man? Dude, it's like PP size and biggest poop and shit. And you know, you know all the all the main stuff. Pac Man high score. Uh, we got the funny things are like the interesting talents. Like Jesse, it says right here. It says he could eat the ass off of a fly. Welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. I'm your host, Mike Squires. Today, I'm joined by my good friend Jimmy Barbetti of Scooped Up. Now, Scooped Up is an on-the-rise pop-punk band from Connecticut. And one thing I admire about Jimmy and Scooped Up is how DIY they are. They literally do everything themselves, from printing merch to their cover art to their music videos. They're putting in a lot more effort than you see a lot of other artists do. I spoke with Jimmy about the process of some of their music videos and opening up for bands like Bowling for Soup. Plus, they have an incredible new album, The Runs, that I got the inside scoop on. If you want to support the Mike Squires and Friends podcast, all you got to do is hit the subscribe button or download on your preferred podcast platform. Now, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Mike Squires and Friends. Jimmy, welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast, dude. Dude, thanks for having me. I appreciate you coming here. Dude, let's bring it back. What does growing up look like for Jimmy, dude? Oh, uh, like, huh, you want to go way back? Let's go all the way back. All the way, oh, shit. I mean, I don't know, let's see. Well, I've, I've Milford, born and raised, been living in been living in Milford my whole life. Um, just, uh, I don't know, just skateboarding and doing art. I've been an artist my whole life, so I've always been drawing and painting ever since I was a little kid. When I was a little kid, that was, like, my first dream. I was like, oh, I want to be an artist, like, be some famous, like, Picasso or whatever. But I had no idea how to do that. So anyway, I was just drawing and shit. Actually got expelled from a uh, Catholic school for drawing uh, violent pictures. That's crazy, dude. <laughs> yeah, like they thought I was gonna like shoot up the school or some shit. Like they're like, "Oh, you gotta go see a psychiatrist," and ended up expelling me. And I went to uh, public school afterwards. Obviously, wasn't crazy, but I was just drawing like the normal thing a ten year old would be drawing. <laughs> like you know, like I don't know, like zombies and aliens killing each other, whatever the fuck. Yeah, which everyone was drawing. Yeah, pretty much. But you know, in Catholic school, they you know they thought it was crazy. Uh, <laughs> so. I continued art and whatever, started getting into graffiti and um, spray paint art in in high school and uh, started smoking weed and skateboarding more. And uh, I used to just do like that was my biggest my big thing then was I want to get good at graffiti and just get my name out there or whatever. So I was doing that for, you know, years and years, just getting good at that. So that's where it, like kind of everything stems off of is the want to be known for something. And, and for a while, it was just, like, for my paintings and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, so then getting into music and stuff, that, like, it was the same thing. You know, I was able to use all the art and everything that I've learned over the years towards that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, and I saw a lot of your graffiti art. It's, like, super awesome, dude. Thank how, you. How did you really get into graffiti? Like, what inspired you to pick up the spray cans, dude? Mm. Had to have been, like, Linkin Park's Meteora album or some shit. Like, you ever listen to Linkin Park? Of course, dude. Yeah, their album is, like, all graffiti all everywhere. And that was just, like, I don't know, it just piqued my interest. And then seeing graffiti everywhere, like, there's a bridge near my house I used to go to all the time and smoke cigarettes as a little <laughs> little kid, <laughs> just being fucking rebellious and shit. And there'd be uh, mad graffiti all over the place. And I'm just looking at the walls like, damn, like, who did that? And there'd be, like, a year stamp to it and all this stuff. Like, these these people that... You know, you have no idea who they are, but they're kind of legends in a way because you're seeing them up everywhere, and that just kind of piqued my interest into doing it. And I was always an artist and and painting every anyway, so <clears throat> just using a spray pa- spray can just seemed like it'd be fun to do. And then after a while, I started getting good at it, and then I really honed into it. You know? Yeah. So, what did early music <laughs> look like for you? <laughs> so that was literally I started playing guitar. I think I was 21. Like, I didn't never picked, or actually, I, when I was a little kid, I played drums for, like, a year or something, but I had the worst ADHD that I was never able to, like, like, when I took, I actually took piano lessons, too, but whenever I take lessons, I just never retained any of the information. I would just, like, go home and not practice, and, uh, like, I would go back to every uh, lesson not knowing anything, and they'd just be like, I don't know, it, would just, it wouldn't go anywhere, so for a while, I just didn't think music was my thing, so art just came more natural, but eventually, I just picked up guitar my friend Vancho just brought a guitar over to my house and, and let me borrow it. And I just started like learning riffs and stuff that I liked. A lot of Blink-182 and just and like Green Day or whatever. And just like stuff that I would skateboard to anyway. So I just start, started learning riffs and then started writing songs. And then one thing led to another and I started like, I don't know, just getting kind of good at it. Started jamming with my, my buddy uh, 
Mikey, who was just as bad at drums as I was bad at guitar. <laughs> so like jamming with a drummer for the first time just felt so sick. I was like, oh my God, this is like a real thing now. And <laughs> even though we sucked so bad, but like then he started getting into drugs and st stopped wanting to jam. And then I was like, fuck, I, I kind of want to do this, you know, even though it's just at this point, I, all I wanted to do was like record some shitty songs to skate to. Like literally bottom line, if I can just record some shitty songs and then I can like listen to them while I skate, you know, I'm happy with that. Cause I was, I was all into art. It wasn't, music was just like a little side hobby. And you know what kind of sucked is like in the beginning, it kind of felt like it would like eat away at me. I'd be like, fuck, I'm wasting all this time making music when I should be like going full in on my art or whatever. But it was like a thing I had to weigh out. You know, if I'm gonna make music, I gotta do that when I'm young and actually give it a shot. Now I can make art for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? No one cares how old a painter is, you know, but they really care about like how old, like the, you know, the newest artist is that they're into or whatever, you know? Yeah. It's, it just has like a big thing. There's a big part of that with music. No, it's true. And I think, you know, I had an interesting conversation with my homie Ryan Oaks recently where, you know, he's in his, or he's in his late twenties, but he feels like he's seeing a lot of artists right now hitting their peak in like their thirties and stuff. But mm -hmm. the traditional is like, it's the new young kid that like these labels are looking at, you know, stuff like that. So I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, but it depends on the on what kind of artist you're trying to be. But yeah, like the newest rapper or whatever, you would imagine to be like some 19 year old kid who's just like seems like they got it all figured out because they're signed by a label, or whatever. That that's just how music in the industry is, you know, especially with pop music. But luckily, I'm not making pop music. <laughs> um, so. Let's see, where was I before? Um, I want to talk about, like, music a little bit in, like, the early... Yeah, it was, so, I was... Oh, so what happened was I wanted to still jam with a drummer, and my friend started doing drugs and fucking off or whatever, and I was, like, thinking, I'm like, who do I know that's a drummer? And then someone, like, I was chilling with was like, oh, your boy Jesse's a drummer, someone that I... Like, I've known Jesse for a couple of years. We used to smoke weed for a while, but I forgot that he was just, like, this amazing drummer that's been, like, a, a drummer since he was, like, a little kid, you know, like, a little prodigy, and... um so one day I texted him, I'm like, yo, you know, you want to jam? I started playing guitar, I wrote some songs or whatever. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm actually jamming with my friend Walter uh, tomorrow. Come on through. And Walter plays bass and he's a friend of Jesse's that they jammed for years and years. So they clicked automatically. So when I went and showed them the songs, we just jammed that day and it just like, it clicked and it was a lot of fun. And I was like, holy shit, like hearing my song played with a good drummer that wasn't like losing time and, yeah. you know, whatever, out of time all the time, like. It just made me become a way better guitar player. Both of them, literally, with Jesse and, and Walter, they're both, like, ready to be professional musicians or whatever, you know? And, like, playing with them got my chops up so much quicker. Yeah. Like, I was only six months into playing guitar that we had, like, we're working on our first album. And, so this like, is where Scooped Up is born. This is Scooped Up. Scooped Up started from right when I picked up guitar. <clears throat> that's when Scooped Up started. It used to be, uh, what did we call it? Fuck. Uh, scump. Scump? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it used to be scump. And then, like, which dates back to, like, years before I even picked up guitar. I literally, I took this, like, punk picture of me just, like, and then, like, I just made an album cover and it said scump on it. And I was just like, yeah, that's my album. And I was just like, I posted it on social media. And, like, years later when I started playing guitar, I was like, oh, we'll call it scump. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> just, so, question. Did, with scump, was that like a made up word or yeah, like? Yeah, it was just some shit. I don't know what, yeah, I just saw the picture of me looking like a scum fuck, I guess, or whatever, <laughs> whatever words I put together, like, I was just, like, just looking like this punk kid in this picture I took, so I just wrote scump above it, I don't know why, and then it looked like an album cover, and then later on we're like, yeah, it's scump, but I remember looking it up and it was taken or something. Like, mm. once it was time to actually be a band, I was like, oh, well, that's taken. And so, with Scooped Up, how we came up with that name is like, my biggest thing was I wanted, uh, something that was kind of familiar already that like if someone asked you like oh have you heard of scooped up you'll be like you know maybe because so many people say scoop like scoop me up or i've scooped this up it's such a normal vocabulary word that it's not so crazy then if i was like yo have you ever heard of the band infected hickey mm, yeah like no i've never heard. never heard of that you know i can tell you right now i've never heard of that band you know but like scooped up you're like oh maybe you know no that's really smart too and like People are familiar with that term too, so it already mm -hmm. does have that feeling to it. So that's actually really smart. I used to say "scoop me" like any anytime someone would like hit me up like back in the day when we'd smoke or whatever, I'd be like, "Yo, scoop me up!" Like that, it was just like part of the everyday vocabulary and shit. So when we looked it up and it wasn't taken, it was like that's it. And yeah. it, it just fit the vibe somehow so perfectly. Yeah, so. let's talk, dumbass. 
You want to talk the first album, dumbass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you caught on to that, yeah. dude. <laughs> I was talking to my homie before, and I was like, I'm so excited to ask that question because it's it's really on how you ask it. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, let's talk dumbass, like clearly, but it's yeah, like yeah. let's talk dumbass. You know? Yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about the first album, man. Yeah, um, that's the reason why we called it dumbass is because we, were, we couldn't think of a name for like so long. We already had it done. And we were just waiting around for this perfect name to come around. And then one day we're just like, fuck it, let's just call it Dumbass. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I looked it up, Dumbass wasn't taken, and we just did it. And, like, uh, the picture is just, it's a picture of, like, a um, a banana peel on yeah, the ground or whatever. Yeah, iconic, dude. Yeah, it was just a picture I randomly took, because I started taking, uh, when I, I went to school to uh, uh, Who's a Tonic Community College for graphic design and <clears throat> photography and shit. I was taking a film photography class, and I was just taking pictures all over the place. And that was just one of the pictures I just randomly took. I think I ate a banana, and then I was like, oh, this would be cool on the ground. And I just took a picture of it, and then I, once I got the film back, I was like, that's an album cover right there. And then we ended up just going with that. And now we also made a logo out of that and made t-shirts and stuff, too. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys print all of your own merch, too. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that? Because I think that's something artists can learn from you, dude. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, even before I even started the band, I learned how to screen print, just from doing uh, graffiti art and stuff. So I was making... Like I used to, I used to tag life's a trip everywhere, like all around town. I don't know if that's going to get me in trouble, but <laughs> in, in Mexico, uh, <laughs> Mexico, yeah, in Mexico, I would do this. Uh, so I made t-shirts that said life's a trip on them. And that was like the first t-shirt I ever made and, and gave it to my friends and like whatever. Um, and then, so like learning how to screen print was like a cool little thing I had in the back of my pockets that when I started the band, I was like, well, obviously we're going to do this t-shirts ourselves just to save money. You know, it costs like three bucks a shirt at that point because like you're just paying for ink and the shirt itself and then you know however much time you feel like putting into it <laughs> so if it's just a one color t-shirt it's easy you just boop that shirt's done but then we started doing um the banana t-shirts and that has like five colors in it so like that takes and i don't have like a professional screen printing operation i have to line it up every time so those <laughs> t-shirts take a while but they're honestly like a piece of art in itself because i'm making it all by hand and shit we actually do we uh we just ordered our first ever run of t-shirts that I'm not making myself. Oh, congratulations, dude. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we got 50 t-shirts with the new logo on it. Let me see. I got a sticker, actually. Oh, yeah. Hold that up for the people, dude. We'll do a zoom in. There you go. Yeah, we, we've got it. <laughs> I see it. <It's> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the new logo. We got that coming on t-shirts, just like this, kind of. Oh, that'd be sick, It'll be dude. like this shirt. <clears throat> and, uh... So I got 50 of those coming for the new tour just so I don't have to sit there and bang it out. Because, I'm dude, I'm working so hard. Every day the past, like, couple months I've been working on just a new little thing for the album release. Like, it's just, whether it's the vinyl or the CDs or these fucking, these baseball cards we just came out with. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's crazy. There's a lot of things just adding up. So I wanted to, you know, have someone do the t-shirts for once. But it saves a lot of money. I'd, I'd suggest every artist do it. You know, just go on YouTube, learn how to fucking screen print. And it's easy. Well, yeah, I want to talk to you about that, too, because I think one thing that I when I look at you and respect a lot is that you guys are just super DIY doing it all yourself. Yeah, we're pretty much 100 percent DIY, except we have a homie that records and mixes and masters our music. You know, that's pretty much it. Everything else we do ourselves. Yeah. How do you feel your background in art has affected? <laughs> Whoops. No, you're good. How do you feel your background in art has affected, you know, the cover arts, the music videos? Um. Well, I think, I think my background in graffiti art, and especially just trying to get up and get my name out there, really affected my my marketing strategies. Mm. You know, and like how I get and how I get my stuff out there online or whatever. But for the most part, for how it how it affects my art and the CDs and stuff, like um, just learning like learning how to use film and take film pictures or whatever, and like develop film and, and whatever. That, like, kind of taught me that I kind of wanted to just do that, like, use film for everything. Like, since I started doing that, which was, like, the, around the first album, any promotional picture that we have out is all shot on film. Just because it has, like, a like a timeless look to it. Compared to if I took pictures in t 2010, you would know that it was a picture taken in 2010 because of how the digital camera, you know, took pictures back then. Or, you, you know, 2014. Or you can even go back to any kind of couple of years or whatever. But when you take something, you shoot something on film, it looks timeless because that's what they used to shoot all album covers on and whatever, you know? 
Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, I have another question that I want to bring off of because I look at a music video like TV Dinner and I see all the painting in the background. Oh, yeah. That's you, dude. Yeah, I painted that. So, that, yeah, that took a month, I think, to paint my homie's room. And this, they, I had a bunch of homies that lived in, like, pretty much an abandoned house. It was like a crack house. But no one did crack. <laughs> it was like a punk house, basically. <laughs> we'd throw shows in there. We'd actually we'd skateboard in the house, whatever. And then one day I was like, yo, let me paint the, the wall. They wanted me to paint the walls. I was like, okay, well, if I do, you got to let me shoot the music video in here. We'll empty the whole room out and shoot a sick video with all my paintings and, and stuff. And, yeah, it was a lot of fun. A ton of fun. Uh, so, you know, that took me like a month to do, just paint every inch of that room. But then it was like the perfect set. And it still exists now. That house almost burnt down. Which we actually shot another music video in the burnt down part of the house. That's crazy, and, dude. Uh, that's something that's on the back. It, like I, I saw, I have. We shot that like years ago, and we, we, uh, it's gonna be on one of the songs from the album. I just have to edit the video and figure out what I'm gonna do with it. But yeah, like, so we're in like this burnt out house. But anyway, yeah, that that whole set is still there. I kind of want to revisit it one day because now it's gotten even more abandoned looking. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, I think you're gonna have a lot of success and just keep leveling up because of. The fact that you're able to do everything by yourself, like even as you've just said, you're going to edit the video, like you're not outsourcing this, you know? No, yeah. Yeah, I shoot and direct and edit all of our music videos and I do all the artwork and the photography. Well, I don't like if I will have someone hold the camera usually, but like I'll do all the the directing of photography, you know, and everything. So, yeah, we're saving tons of money in that sense, because now, you know, I think we have 14 music videos out right now and we have like one coming out with the album the day of and then I have two more that are shot. And I want to do another one that's like a big deal, like kind of how Best Days was like a big deal in a way. Well, like, I got this video that's just going to be a compilation vi video of just footage of just random shit. So that's not really like a big deal is what I mean. So like I want to do like another video with like a script and shit. Um, probably one more for the album. So that'll make like, I think we have four out right now for the album and then... So maybe, so eight in all, I think. Yeah, and, but the fact that you have a plan of action is amazing too because most artists will just make the song and that's that's the end of it for them. They'll post it up when the game is just so much more than that, dude. Dude, this is four years in the making. That's what I'm saying, dog. <laughs> and that, that's mostly because of COVID. Like, we started writing this album like a, like 2019, I think. It was right after our, our EP that we dropped in 2019 um, that had TV Dinner on it. And... Um, I was just writing songs or whatever. Then COVID happened and then I just couldn't write any songs that I, like, I didn't want to write about sitting at home all the time or whatever. I didn't want to write like these, you know, lockdown songs, which the I felt like everybody was there. doing. Exactly. So there was no inspiration. It took me like two years to get back into like feeling good and wanting to write feel good music, which is what I want to write. You know what I mean? I don't want to write depressing shit. And, uh, but then finally we finished writing the album like whenever, I don't even know, maybe 2020. We finished writing it, and then ever since then, it's just been working on videos and everything. So and what what drives you to keep going, dude? Uh, just <laughs> I'm just a creative ass person. I've always been creating my whole life, and I've just I just got a plan to make as much creative shit as I can, just like a, compile as much art and music and videos or whatever as I can before I'm dead, and that's the plan, I guess. Yeah, born a creative, die a creative, dude. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, they say you die twice or whatever, you know, like, once when you actually die, and then once when, like, everyone... The last in, person says your name, dude. Yeah, anybody who's ever known you ever existed, once they die, and you're just completely forgotten... It's crazy that you just said this. But that's why I create, is because this stuff is now forever there. Dude, it's you know? insane that you just said that. I was on the phone with my dad last night, and I said the exact same thing. I was had this conversation with him. Well, so. that's a, I, I forget who originally said this quote, but yeah, yeah that's a quote. I, actually, well, I heard it from Banksy the first time, I think. Oh, that's you know, crazy. The, the graffiti artist of Banksy? Of course, dude. Yeah, so that's a big thing that circles back to graffiti is like, that's... You know, most graffiti artists are just trying to get their name out there and be remembered for something. Yeah. And most of these guys are like drug addicts or gangbangers or whatever, but like they go out and they fucking write their name on shit. And that's how they get, you know, their sense of like belonging in this world, you know? And so that's kind of why I use where I got that sense, I guess, as an artist and just I put it all into this music now. Now I'm just now scooped up is like my outlet to do all my art because I do, you know, I do graffiti art for the band or whatever or like video or photography or anything that I want to scratch a creative itch, I could do it for the band. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the best days music video, dude, because you know, that was kind of my introduction to you because 
I'm watching you guys ride around in this van, but your guitar is hooked up to the steering wheel. Like, uh, yeah. what was the idea behind that? Like, how did that come to be? And how did you guys pull that idea off? Well, it was just, it was honestly a nat- the most natural video f- that came to me. Like most, most of the time I'll, I'll be kicking around for months. Like I need to come up with my next big music video idea because we have songs and I just, we need to shoot videos and keep them going. Cause it takes a month or so to edit them or, or to shoot them. Like that video took a, a month or two to, et- to shoot at the end of, uh, I think it was, 2022 that summer we shot it yeah and it didn't come out till a year later um just from not it didn't take that long but like just we just did it that early and then you yeah know, whatever but uh it took us like a while just because there's so many logistic things i would have well basically the, the idea actually it came from i just bought the van because i needed a van <laughs> and i had some extra cash and then i was like saving up i was like what should i buy like what do i need for the band like what will we need and a van was just like all right let's get, we need a van you know for when we go on tour or whatever and i've always even when I started doing painting and doing graffiti art, I always just wanted a van that I could graffiti the shit out of and then drive around like town that said like, you know, murals, call my number or whatever, and then have a graffitied up van. But this van was too nice to do that with. <laughs> so I didn't end up doing that. But like, that was like, I've always wanted just like a van, I guess, you know, for, whether it was for my art or now it's for the band and it makes more sense to have it for the van. But once I bought the van, it was just obvious. Like we need to make a music video of us driving around in the van playing. And I thought, how funny would it be if my guitar was tied to the steering wheel and I got a brick on the gas and it just looks like we're just uh, barreling down the street playing our music, you know, and, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun to film, but it was a logistic nightmare because I have my $15,000 camera being held out the window of a moving car that I gave to my friend who's following me in the <laughs> van and I'm like trying to hide to make it look like no one's driving the van and stuff. It was a lot of fun, but there was so much that went into it and yeah, it took like a month or two or whatever and a lot of help from friends. No, you guys did a great job, dude. Cause when I watched that video, all I see is a van driving itself. And I'm just like, it kind of actually adds like a little anxiety to the whole situation. Cause you're like, it does, I guess. Yeah. I think that was my most, I think out of all the videos I've shot for the band, I think that one was the most ambitious for sure. And like we pulled it off there. Like I, as far as uh, it's pretty much perfect in my eyes, there's maybe a couple of little things I would have done better. But, you know, I'm pretty much, I'm really happy with that video yeah. compared to the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been able to use the tour van a lot? I know that, I'm pretty sure you guys did a show at a place called Bug Jar. Yeah, that was the farthest we've gone so far. That was in Rochester, New York. Okay. Great food out there. Let's go, dude. <laughs> yeah, they had a place called Dogtown out there, which, like, I don't know if you've ever been to Dogtown in Milford. No, I haven't. Not the same place at all, but their, their Dogtown, so good. Dogtown in Milford is also really good. But, uh... This this place has been around since like I don't know maybe the seventies or something or eighties and it was just like fire and I, I, I dream about it I want to go back to Rochester just for that food but yeah we went to the, we went and played the Bug Jar uh, with a bunch of hardcore bands and some friends and stuff uh, it was fun it was a lot of fun it was like the type of bar that had like its own built in crowd so we didn't have to worry about drawing anybody so we just showed up played a show to a fucking packed place and then got to leave and it was a lot of fun but yeah we do we do do uh, we do do. <laughs> uh, weekenders and stuff. We don't really do tours. Like we're, we're doing our first tour coming up this year. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that eventually. Yeah, but it's not like a cons- it's not like a uh, like everyday tour. It's every weekend. So we do come home in between them all, just because like the other guys have full time jobs and stuff. So. They have to meet, you know, they have to do that. It's also smarter to do that starting out, too, because those are the days. money. Not only does it save money, but those are the days that people can actually make the shows. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, so we're only doing Saturdays and a couple Fridays um, on the weekends throughout uh, uh, February, March, and April. Now, I don't know if I know this correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the horn of the van is the Godfather theme. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. Yeah, <laughs> they came with. So the, I bought the van from an Italian guy, an old Italian motherfucker, and uh, he put, he must have put that on there because he loves the Godfather. But it's perfect because I'll just I'll press it and I only play like two notes of it, so it'll be like, <laughs> and it's just really funny. But uh, it actually broke, and I I, I got to fix the button. That's yeah. all it is. But uh, yeah, it was a fun fact about it. So whenever I'd roll up to shows, we would just go like. Because <laughs> I would never let it play the whole thing. I would just do a little bit of it. It was, it was so much fun. That's silly. I mean, you guys have played a lot of shows. <laughs> I feel like I'm always seeing you guys consistently do shows. You know, what's one of the craziest things that have happened at a show that you've done? Mm, we've had, like, people throw up, I guess. I don't know. Like, what's, what's crazy? Like, Or, like, maybe just energy. Our last couple of shows have been off the chain. Our, since... Like we played Shoreline Festival at uh, the Beer Axe. I don't remember when that was, but ever since then, every show 
has just been off the chain and been getting growing and and like everyone's moshing and shit. So nowadays, like our shows are how they should have been, like from the beginning, you know, like everyone's moshing and crowd surfing or whatever and like that like having lots of fun. When before, like, you know, we we spent years just playing to like, you know, the other bands and their girlfriends or whatever, you know. But everyone starts off that way. Or like playing to just like a you know, a handful of people and everyone's kinda of just standing there not really like digging it, you know. But We've made enough of a name for ourselves now that everything is starting to snowball and people are coming to the shows and having fun and it's, it feels great. <laughs> Dude, and you guys opened for Bowling for Soup, if I'm not mistaken, too. We did, yeah. That was like our one of our biggest achievements for sure. Um, I, I became friends with Jarrett through social media, the singer of Bowling for Soup. And um, I don't even know how, actually, but... We just started like DMing randomly and I'd be like, yo, I, like, cause I, I would throw these skate park shows. I remember one time I was drunk and I just DM him and I'm like, dude, I'll pay you a thousand dollars. Come play at our skate park. And he's like, oh, that sounds sick. But you know, a thousand dollars wouldn't even cover the plane tickets for my whole crew or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm drunk, but yo, we should play a show soon. And like literally, uh, a month or so later he DMs me and he's like, yo, we're coming through, uh, Hamden and we're doing this acoustic tour. You want to, you want to hop on and open? And, uh, it would have to be acoustic, but like, you know, you guys can do it. And we're like, hell yeah. I literally went out and bought an acoustic guitar that day. Cause the one I had was a piece of shit. So I was like, I need a good one that I can play my songs fast enough and clean enough in front of a, a full audience. Cause I knew it was going to be a great show. And so I did that. And then we transposed our songs acoustically, which I write them all acoustically anyway. Like, you know, they start off as just me singing and playing guitar. So it wasn't too hard to, to bring like, it back, do that. Yeah. But those, that show was so fun. Packed show. All of our friends came out. And, like, that was, like, a real big stepping stone for us, for sure. Yeah. And it's cool that Bowling for Soup, like, you know, gave you the cosign and showed yeah. love. And w the coolest part was that we were the only opener. So it was us and Bowling for Soup. Amazing, It was, it was the Bowling for Scooped Up show. Dang. And that's how I was, like, promoting it. And uh, it was so much fun. Dude, I have a super embarrassing story with Bowling for Soup <laughs> that I didn't think was ever going to come back up. But I feel like if there's any moment, I should just quickly it's tell it right now. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it must have been Warp Tour 2013, 2014. They were on that. And I was there with this bl blog at the time, like back when blogs were very yeah, popular, yeah, yeah. a college of music, and we were doing interviews. So I was filming some of these interviews and I didn't know, and th I just didn't know who the Bowling for Soup dude was. And it might've been, he had glasses and a goatee. I'm not yeah, very yeah. familiar or like a beard. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm filming this interview and I turn over and I was like, Hey man, can you just be quiet and I was like that young dude and he was like dude we're all supposed to be in this room doing interviews and I just like felt so bad keep in mind I'm like 15 oh 16. so he was doing a different interview he was doing an interview uh, and I was like <laughs> <laughs> but uh no I, I funny. dude I lose sleep sometimes thinking about that I'm just, those are the, I hate those moments <laughs> just, just like why did I do I was young you know but uh those moments for me are when I like call someone by their wrong name for whatever reason that eats me alive I'm just like fuck you just got to be like, my guy yeah, or like, my literally. dude. No, my biggest fear is someone just being like, what's my name? Like someone that I see all the time. Like, and dude, I'll just be like, it, fuck. <laughs> it's like such like, an I know it, dude, but like, you're putting me on the spot. It's an irrational fear. It'll never happen. <laughs> I know. But if it does, that's crazy, dog. I know. Yeah. No, I know most people's names, but there's just like, once, once a lot of people know who you are and like, if you're a memorable person, someone you briefly met will remember you or whatever. And then you see them years later and it's like, fuck, how do I know you? Like, I don't like, what's up? I'm always, I'm familiar with every, or I'm uh, friendly with everybody. So even if, even if I completely don't know someone at all and they're just like coming out to me, like they know me and they're like, yo, what up? I'm just, I'll, you know, give them the time of day to do it. But like, yeah, I'm so bad at remembering names of people that I don't my go see a lot. My go-to line is how's everything been? Uh, because it could apply to someone that you just met or someone that you've known forever. Hey, that's it's, a good, that's how's a good one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or just like, how's your parents? Because everyone's got parents. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I also saw that Knuckle Pucks shouted you out recently. Yeah, I actually just went and saw them last night. Oh, awesome, yeah, I just, dude. I was just in uh, New York City last night. Uh, it was, so yeah, uh, they played at Toad's Place in New Haven. Yeah, and I was iconic just, venue. Yeah, great. I love going there. Um, and I was just at the show. Didn't know that they even knew my band at all. And like right before the last song, uh, Nick, their guitar player, is just like, all right, this last song goes out to a local band from here. They're called Scooped Up. And I'm just like, what? Literally like, shit my pants right there. I'm like, am I dreaming? And I'm like, what? And he's like, I see you there, my man. And then like, they're like, cheers, cheers to Scooped Up. And I'm, I'm just sitting there like, what the fuck? And I feel like I literally made like a joke earlier that night. Like, yo, what if they like shouted me out or something? Or like, <laughs> and it literally happened. It was insane. And, uh, I, 
later on, I, uh, like a month or two later, I finally, like someone was like, yo, I was at that show. Like someone, just a fan at like another show or whatever, someone that I ended up becoming friends with. But, uh, they were, they were like, yo, I actually was at that show and I filmed the whole show. Let me see if I have that video. I'm like, dude, if you have that, that'd be so sick. Cause I was never able to like prove it. Yeah. But, you know, like what was sick actually was there was, I saw so many friends there that night, like so many friends in other bands and everything that I just saw early in that night. And then like after the show, everyone's like, dude, how'd you get them to shout you out? I'm like, I, I don't know, but it was the sickest, coolest feeling. But then once I found that video, I ended up, uh, like it was, that was amazing in itself, but like I posted that and then it was just like so gratifying to, to do that, you know, and like show that it actually did happen. You mean this video dog? Oh shit. Wait for it. I did my homework dog. Let's go, dude. Hell yeah. Come on, dude. Yeah, I literally like shit my pants <laughs> during that. I was like, are you serious? And then, yeah, that's the video. So my a friend of mine that I um, met through shows and stuff, like I'd seen him later on. I was like, I actually got that video. And he sent it to me. I'm like, dude, you're the man. Bro, that's the goat because literally. those moments don't always happen. You can't prepare for them. So I know. You're just like, man, fingers crossed, dude. Yeah. So then I went to uh, I went to Vegas over this in, uh, in October and I saw them play at a record release show in... Um, Zaya Records, like their record just came out the day before or that day or something. And they played a show inside the record store and sold like exclusive vinyl or whatever and signed the vinyl and everything. And uh, I'm at this show and I literally, I like, they're like two songs in and the crowd is kind of just standing there because it's like a record store. No one really knew whether to mosh or whatever. And I like the mosh starts and I just fucking jump up and I start crowd surfing. And then I ended up on like, they like took a picture of that and it ended up on their page and like Amazing, a bunch dude. of videos of that ended up all over the internet. And then I got to chop it up with them after the, the show while they were signing records. And yeah, I, so I literally saw them last night and um, they tried, like Nick tried to get us on the guest list, me and Leo. Yeah. But I guess it was filled up because it was New York. So we New ended, York's always a busy show no matter who it is, dude. Yeah. So we ended up get figuring out a way, Got we got tickets and stuff. And then he ended up uh, hooking us up with some free shirts and stuff. And I gave him a, a weed pen in, in a... Uh, to, to to thank him for shouting us out. And so, yeah, it was cool. Now we're like homies. Hopefully one day they'll fucking play a show with us, you know? Yeah, no, that would be sick. But or I, we'll play a show with them. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, you guys are leveling up little by little, dude. I see it happening. And, mm -hmm. you know, the word is spreading around. You guys are growing. Yeah, I'm hoping this, this new record will really make a splash, you know? I'm excited to talk about that. You know, before we get into the runs, I want to bring it back a little bit to Dumbass again. Because oh, yeah, let's do it. I want to talk to you about, there were tattoos. You gave some tattoos of the banana to people. Yeah, I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was after the album came out, and uh, that was in that punk house, basically. A lot of those people I was uh, hanging out with, they were just like, I just bought a tattoo gun, and I gave my friend Taras a tattoo, and he had like already just like the worst tattoos. Like, my tattoo was, like, his, his first good one. And this was oh, my no. first ever tattoo. tattoo? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, I, you know, I was decent enough at it just because I've been drawing my whole life and stuff. So I just, like, freehanded with fucking pen uh, the banana on him. And then I, t I tattooed over the pen. No fucking gloves. It was, like, the most unsanitary thing. It didn't get infected, though, I guess. So whatever. Do fucking tattoos in abandoned houses, abandoned punk houses. It's not... <laughs> I mean, that's pretty punk rock of you, dude. Yeah, it was... So I did, like, three three bananas, I think. And then I did, like, uh, like some other characters and other things. I haven't done that many tattoos, but that was just a fun little side quest. I'll probably do more later on in life or whatever. <laughs> I got to break out my tattoo gun. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk Weed Song a little bit, dude. How did that come about, you know? That was like our first, I think probably our first really good song, or at least for me, that was like, it was when I wrote it, I was like so stoked on it just cause it was like a little bit of what I wanted to do was like, it was like a joke song and it told a story, but it was also catchy and was good enough as like a song. It stood up as like a song cause we had joke songs like this one, skip this song that's like 15 seconds and it's just like this stupid joke song that's not a good song, <laughs> but it's just like a funny thing. And like we had songs that are like 30 seconds called skate and shit and like, I don't know, shit like that. Like, we had songs that didn't even make it to that album. They were just real dumb, stupid joke songs, and then eventually started writing good shit, or good shit. But uh, Weed Song was the first joke song that was also, like, a good song. It's very similar to, like, TV Dinner, which, like, also tells a story and is kind of, like, has tongue-in-cheek lyrics and is kind of a joke, but is also a good song in a way because it's catchy and shit. But, um, so Weed Song was the first one for me that, like, I was like, oh, man, this, this is, like, the kind of songs I want to write. And it was like the first song that like people actually 
I guess liked and like gravit like latched onto. It was like the first song that song that was like sung back to us by a crowd and shit like that. And then the video just like you know I think brings it all to life. It was like m- one of my first videos that was good too. You know. Yeah. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with that and. One day I want to re-record it just because it's not like up to par of how it sounds now live, but um, but yeah, it was definitely like a good. I felt good at the time after only playing guitar for about a year, after, and then writing that song and then putting it out. It was a lot of fun. Well, that's the thing too. I wanted to talk to you about this just about the dumbass era altogether. Is that that project was real DIY? Like you were yeah. doing everything at that time yourself. Yeah, we recorded it all ourselves, and it just doesn't sound very good. Um, because of that, we ended up taking all the recordings to our friend Randy, who does all our shit now, and he like helped us put it together the first time, and then that's what you hear now is like he mastered it and shit. He took all the stuff that we recorded at Jesse's house, and then we fixed and re-recorded some shit, and then he mastered it all. And then after that, we're like, you know what? We should just go to you for everything and just record with you. <laughs> and then so that's what we've been doing, and uh, it's it's real laid back. It's real still really DIY like. If we get money, we probably want to still go to a studio eventually one day. But, like, right now, we're, it's a pretty chill operation we got going with our homie that we just, like, we go and smoke and just chill. And we don't have to pay hourly or nothing. We just dump him a lot of, like, whatever, what, what he's asking for. And I also tip him out a lot just because we, we are chilling there for a long time sometimes. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, and I just give him weed or whatever. So he's happy and we're happy. We have a lot of fun doing it. So until, like, I don't know, we'd have to make some more money or something to figure out how to <laughs> yeah, get dude. better recordings. But right now it sounds good for what they are. Bro, but the thing is the the biggest battle, the big old biggest hurt is <laughs> well, hold on, the biggest hurdle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, the, the biggest battle, the the biggest hurdle that you face though is just getting started, dude, because a lot of people won't make that first step. And mm-hmm. the thing is, it's okay to get better as you go. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, I always wish that I started younger or like earlier. Like I wish I started my band in high school, but I bet you we would have sucked. You know <laughs> what I mean? So I'm glad that I took, I'm glad it wor- worked the way it did because when we started, I was already good at graphic design and videography and, and art and shit to where even our first EP that was just like some shitty songs that we recorded ourselves. Um, they had music videos and everything like, and so from the get go, we were like, a little bit more official than we ever were. Like we always, we've always been faking it till we made it, you know, yeah. in a sense. But the thing is you have to suck when you start, dude. That's just yeah. part of the game, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. Like if you heard some of my early stuff, you can't even hear it because I took it down. It sucks so bad, dog. Yeah. I always, sometimes I feel like taking down some of our old stuff, but it stands up. It's all right. It's good enough. Like I, we've taken that, like skip this song, the first v- recorded version of that song. We took that off YouTube just cause that's really bad. And it's a bad song anyway. But, uh, like, um, but other than that, like, I don't know, it's, it's good to listen back. And I'm so stoked on finally releasing this album because this is the best representation of where we've been for the past five years. Let's go. You know dude. what I mean? And so like for these past five years, there's been more shitty scooped up than there is good scooped up. Cause as far as I'm concerned, Everything after dumbass is like is good is is what I'll like I can listen to that for the rest of my life and be happy with it whatever everything on high try sample and everything on this album I'm a hundred percent behind and uh, like I if people don't like it I don't care like I know it's good for what I can do you know what I mean like I'm I'm happy with what I put out with this so that's that's all I could have but finally once this comes out we'll have more good scooped up than we have bad scooped up <laughs> yeah well you know my question to you is. You know, I know I get this a lot, and I'm sure you do too, dude. How do you deal with the criticism? Because sometimes people have overbearing opinions. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in the beginning, I wasn't very good with it. I'd always talk shit and, like, one-up <laughs> them a little bit. Like, because I'll just go out, out of pocket on these people. But, um, no, we don't really get much criticism. Like, it, it would only be—the only criticism I would get is if I'm running an ad on Facebook for whatever reason. And some grumpy motherfucker is just like, why am I getting this? This yeah. sucks. And I'm like— fuck you, dude, show me your music or whatever, you know, that you'd say in the beginning. And, uh, but no, I don't let it get to me. We don't get any hate. We don't get any hate now. So uh, dude, well, you know, I've, I've learned to deal with hate a little bit differently cause I get a good amount and my homie Atlas put me on to this. He says, when you're getting hate, it's actually a good thing because yeah. it's when the algorithm is basically showing you, the algorithm is basically showing you to new people. That's true too. Yeah. 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 Okay. I see that. That. that but also, if you're, you know, if you're getting hated on, you're doing something right. That's yeah, what people say. You know. You know. So I'm sure we have haters, but they just don't. They don't speak the 
They don't. I don't know where they. They're just lurking in the shadows. Yeah, literally, they're dude. out there sti- ripping our stickers off. That's I. I know you're out there. I see my stickers getting ripped off. But oh, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, dude, I would never, dude. You got to go over with like the nail polish or something, yeah, dude. Right. No, uh, it's well. I was literally in New York yesterday, and I saw a couple sti- stickers that I put up like ripped off. But those are definitely like city workers that go around and clean up the shit. Yeah. But like anywhere else, like the I haters saw, really da- deep down. They, those are the real haters. But <laughs> um, but like there was a sticker at the mall I saw that was like half ripped off. I was like, someone was trying to rip this off mm. you which half though the up part or the scooped part it was just like it, like you could still see it all so oh. it was just the top of the sticker or mm. whatever it was a failed attempt yeah right yeah if, it, if they ripped off the up it still says scooped <laughs> but yeah okay this is a random fact too you cameoed in a music video as a schoolyard bully oh i did yeah i told uh, you i did my research dude yeah, how'd you find that yeah that was our homie uh our homies in mighty tortuga uh one of their music videos they asked me to be in it and uh and yeah i was just like well, it was a skate park bully, not yeah. a schoolyard bully, okay. but yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I just, I played just like some tough guy, I guess, even though that's the opposite of what I am. So that's what kind of made it funny. And, um, yeah, that was just a fun little video I helped my friends out with. Yeah. They actually like, or they are still a band, but like their singer, they just like kind of, they're on hiatus right now. I guess they need a new singer or something. Yeah. But those are the homies. I want to talk to you too, kind of just about the band members too, if that's cool. Yeah. So... I know, so basically, I actually really in, got intro to you guys via Leo, mm-hmm. because... Our bass player, yeah. Yeah, so you're a bass player, because uh, my girlfriend's sister's husband's friend is Leo. <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? <laughs> yeah, so I'd always be at, like, you know, these, like, hangouts with Leo all the time, and mm-hmm. that's how I, like, got introduced to you guys, so... You know, I want to talk to you just, like, about how the band got formed, and, you know, your guys' relationship with each other. Um, so... Basically the, so I, I hit up Jesse and that's how me and him started jamming was, was just me hitting him up. And then from day one, me and him have just been fully into this and that's where scooped up started. And then when Walter left the band, we needed someone to fill in and, uh, Leo had jammed with Jesse in, in bands back in the day and they've always been friends or whatever. So that's how I met Leo was Jesse was like, Oh, well I got, I got a friend who plays guitar and Leo plays guitar. He actually wasn't a bass player beforehand yeah. so he's, he's a better guitar player than I am actually but I just happen to be writing the songs and shit and like and uh, I don't know my fingers aren't made for bass but uh, <laughs> so um, so he took up the uh, he, he picked up the bass and decided to jump in our band and help us out with it when we needed it and now he's full time in the band for I guess maybe for a little while it was probably like I don't know how serious he was with it like in the very beginning it was just kind of helping us out we had some shows and stuff and then things started to, like, especially when he joined, like, the band was just, like, phew, it was just for fun, kind of. And, like, there was no, like, we had high hopes and stuff, but there it, we hadn't proved any of them yet. And then once he joined the band, we wrote so many more better songs and uh, ended up finishing the first album with him. So, like, a couple of the songs on the first album have Walter playing and some of them have Leo. And um, if you ask me, the best songs that we wrote were at the end of that session, like, Weed Song and Delete This were I think the last two songs that I wrote for that album. And then Leo wrote his parts. And like one of the the bass lines in Weed Song is, is like the one that he the bass line that he wrote for Weed Song is like perfect and it sounds so good. And he was a perfect fit. Like Walter was a great bass player, but he was like a a progressive like new metal or like gent player. I don't know. He was he wasn't a pop punk uh bass player. Or yeah. just you know what I mean? Like he he would always play too much and we'd kinda have to dial it down. You know what I mean? Like, he'd put too much into it or whatever. Leo was, like, he grew up on pop punk just like I did, and he's, we're very into the same kind of music, so he was, like, the perfect fit because of that. And he all, he brought so much to the table that was, like, easily, it easily fit with what we were already doing. So he was a great, great fit, and ever since then, we've just been on the up, on the up and up. Yeah. And, and Leo's also a great musician, just as good as Jesse is on the drums, so, like, so much better than I am as a musician that, like, they, they still bring me up and get me to be better, you know? Like, I wouldn't be half the musician that I am today without playing with these guys because they're so good. Yeah. But I'm just a creative force that, like, these songs would have been coming out anyway, or if I had put the time to it, whatever. Like, just having the motivation of the band doing better and better gives me the motivation to write more music, and it's just snowballing from there, you know? So how's working on the album with these guys, you know, when you're in the studio? <laughs> what, is, what do the studio sessions for the runs look like? Uh, well, when we go to record, we don't write in the studio at all. So it's, we'll, we'll have 
the songs written, you know, months beforehand, play them live. Like we've been playing all these songs for years. Mm. If you come to any of our shows, like we, you've been hearing unreleased songs for years because they're our best shit. Like we're not going to play the old stuff and stick to that because this stuff's not out. It's just not, you know. Yeah. And by the time you get in the studio, you've already played them so many times that when you're going to lay them down, you've like. We're just doing it. Yeah, literally. So the way that we write our songs is I'll write the the melodies and the and the guitar and like most of the structure of the song. Then I'll bring it to the band. It depends on who I, I like we get to jam with first. Sometimes I'll go to Jesse first and then we'll get the drums like kind of situated at what we're going to do with that. And then I'll sit down with Leo and show him the song and then he'll come up with his parts and then we'll put it all together. And sometimes we'll change up the arrangement if it needs to, but like all the best songs are the type of songs that I can like, they come to me in like 20 minutes, like weed song, all the hits, honestly, like, I'll sit there and I'll come up with like a little idea and I'll bang it out in 20, 30 minutes and that's the song. And then all it needs is the drums and the in the bass. And like, those are usually the best songs. And that's why I try to strive for that. Just making something from scratch, just like, you know, capturing a the lightning in a bottle type thing, you know? Yeah, a lot of people will say the first idea you have is the best idea. Yeah. And if you overthink it, like sometimes it gets too clouded and then mm -hmm. it's not what it would have been. Yeah, because I'll go, I'll write dozens of songs that are just like a verse or just a chorus or whatever. And then I kind of just like, don't I'll return back to that idea and it's so hard to, to finish those ideas because I'm not in the same headspace or whatever like like I said all the best ones that I come up with are literally just boom here's the idea and like this inspiration's here like capture it right now if you can and then when I do that's when you know that's when it, the good stuff comes so yeah the way that we write is I'll write the song the the lyrics and the melody and the guitar or whatever and then we'll come together and we'll change arrangement sometimes and they'll put their stuff into it and usually, like, a lot of the stuff, their ideas, like, that they put into it will kind of affect some of the stuff that I end up playing. And, and yeah, that's, we've been doing that ever since the beginning. And it's worked really good. Yeah. Let's talk about the runs overall. Let's just get through the, every aspect of the project, dude. I'd love to talk to you about, like, the songs on there, the mm -hmm. cover art, just everything. Okay. So. Yeah, we can show these bad boys <sighs> off, dude. Oh, well, here, I got the. Uh, oh, the jumbo, dude. Here's the vinyl. This is the first time we've ever done. Um, anything on vinyl. So this is our, our first ever big release in a way, you know, on this transparent blue. Come on, dude. vinyl. It it works as a great frisbee. It even has uh right here etched in on the vinyl. Does it, it says, work as a great frisbee? It does. You want to see? That? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it says right here. It says use this as a frisbee etched in. That's amazing, dude. So I was <laughs> you're able to do custom etching. So I added that in just for fun. But uh, yeah. Uh. Basically, I shot the cover art on film <clears throat> uh, at the baseball field near my house. And, like, you know what's funny is, like, for months we were trying to come up with a better album name. <laughs> and, uh, like, for whatever reason, I had this idea for years. I was, like, um, imagine, like, I was just I just had the idea for maybe an EP or whatever, like, naming it The Runs, and then it's a shot on a baseball field, and, and like, it's kind of a planned home runs or whatever, but yeah. there's poop coming out of my pant leg, and that's what the runs are. Is the fucking got the runny shits, and uh, and I had this picture in my head for years of just like the legs, the shit, and then the pitcher looking between the legs. Who's the pitcher? That's Jesse, oh, the, amazing, the drummer. Dude. So um, yeah, so once uh once it came down to the end, like it took us months when we were just like literally everything was riding on the album name. Like we needed the album name so that we could release shoelace with the date and the name of the album and all that shit. And everything was riding on this. So I'm like, fuck it, let's just go with the runs because I've already had this idea for so long. We could go shoot the cover right now. So then Jesse was like, all right, let's shoot the cover and we'll see how it comes out. And then once we saw like how it came out, it was exactly how I imagined. We were like, all right, fuck it, let's go with it. Because we kind of wanted, like, we thought it was going to be too much of a joke name or whatever, but there's no joke songs on the album. So the joke is the album cover. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I literally like painted all these pic these uh, things to look the way they do. Yeah, like, you were telling me. Yeah, like the when I turned up the saturation, the pants were just way too noisy. There was like reds and greens and all these little pixels in there. So I painted that uh, black and white, and then I overlaid it with this like dark blue. And then uh, in Photoshop, did it overlay or whatever. And uh, this blue, I made more blue, and the green, I made more green. The ground, I made it the way it looks. It looks way different on the. CD. Yeah, just because of how things get printed, you know? I was pissed, dude. I called them. I'm like, dude, why is it so dark? And anyway, but uh, something in between both of these is what it's supposed to look like. If you look at it on streaming services, it looks exactly how I, 
you know, wanted it, but I'm happy with both. It's cool. Um, it's really sick having this big version of it, you know? Yeah. No, the photo on the back is awesome too. Yeah. So this, the whole, uh, baseball theme that we got going on. So that's why we got baseball cards too. So whenever you, everybody who, uh, buys the album, they get a whole bundle. They get, um, they get the album on vinyl. They get the CD. They get the baseball cards. They get some stickers. They get shoelaces and a guitar pick. This is scooped up. Also, and that's super cool, dude. I mean, like to put that much thought and effort into your merch and like mm -hmm. even just the cover art. Like, you know, those are the details that you know that you put in, but no one's gonna know that you painted the I, pants, dog. Oh yeah, you know I, what I, I mean. Got, I gotta tell nope, it. Yeah. I painted the pants that color, dude. You know. Yeah, I wanted it to look a certain way, and it, and and it looks how I wanted it to. Yeah, when when you're doing it all yourself. You know, they just no, see the final product, dude. Yeah, exactly. And you want things to be perfect, especially when you do it. And you want to, you know, if you do it yourself, you do it right or whatever. I don't know. If you want something done right, you do it yourself. And that's Amen, how we do it dude. ourselves. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, we got these baseball cards. These are sick. It's they, so dope. They're real baseball card mater like material. It's like, the, it's like an actual baseball card that we printed. So these were, when we did uh, the cover, um, that was one day just shooting pictures for the cover. And then like a, a couple weeks later, we we're like, oh, we should do a baseball themed um photo shoot just because we need a lot of promo and shit so then we took these pictures and then later on we we're like oh let's make baseball cards so it actually just like worked out perfectly we had these pictures from months ago and then we made the baseball cards like this month like and uh it's funny because they got all these funny stats on i was the gonna back. ask about the stats what are the stats looking like oh, man dude, it's like pp pee -pee size and biggest poop and shit and you know you know all the all the main stuff pac-man high score uh we got the funny things are like the interesting talents like jesse it says right here it says he could eat the ass off of a fly Mmm, impressive, dude. <laughs> Pretty good shit, huh? He's got taste buds in his butt. You know, mm. all, all the best stuff. The things that you'd need to know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so there's only 500 copies of these, and these are just like little gag things. If if uh, if someone wanted to just buy these, it would just be a dollar because we got them for mad cheap. You'd be surprised. They're actually rat really cheap to print uh, baseball cards, if anyone's wondering. No, it is good to know because, I mean, there are so many artists out there that probably can take a lot of value from, like, what you said today, too, that, like— I've never seen anyone do this, too. Yeah. Doing baseball cards. I mean, I've seen uh, people do, like, holographic—like, Neck Deep did, like, these plasticky, like, holographic cards where if you spin it this way and that way, it changes pictures or whatever. You know oh, what I know about? what you're talking about, yeah. So they did that with the—like, if you bought the CD, you'd get one of those, and, like, you'd have to buy, like, four versions of the CD, I guess, to get them all or whatever, which is a pretty cool tactic, but, like— I've never seen baseball cards. Yeah. So. No, and it fits with the theme of everything, too. Like, Yeah, it's perfect. Do you feel more prepared going into this album than any other thing that you've done ever? Yeah, 100%. And I'm still, every day, I'm still working on what I need to get done still. Like, I just ordered a big banner that's got the new logo on it. Just ordered t-shirts with the new logo on it. We got um, stickers coming in for, for the vinyl. Whenever you buy... <clears throat> Whenever you buy vinyl from like a band or from like a record store or whatever, there's a little hype sticker that says what what it is, like yeah. the color vinyl, like the limited pressing, all that shit. So I got stickers that say like, you know, scooped up the runs, limited edition, uh, transparent blue vinyl, limited to 200 copies. So if you want to keep it sealed, you know that you have the first ever pressing. So I'm so I ordered those. Now we're gonna stick those on everyone. So like little things like that. I'm just trying to think of every little thing that I'm going to need. We're getting like a drum head made that says scooped up and it's awesome. got like for one the of shows my paintings. And stuff. Yeah. So, so we got all these shows coming up that I want to have stuff ready. I want to talk to you about that because you're booking all these shows, right? Yeah. Talk so, and it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> Can we talk about the process of doing that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, it's This is my first time doing, like I've booked shows locally all the time, but like doing just like this, it's so different because now you have to like, I'm, I'm asking my friends, like, what venues have you played in different states that are cool or whatever? And um, I'm asking people around, like, what, like, I need to find some house venues and some house show venues. Like, DIY venues are the best because, like, they're usually all ages, BYOB, and a house show. Everyone goes, like, and wants to party. So it, those are usually packed. So I found a couple in New Jersey, and then I DM them, and I'm like, yo, we're trying to, trying to put on some shows for our tour. Uh, we could book the locals, we could make the flyer, all that stuff, whatever. So first I would just lock down the venue and then lock down the date. And so it started off with just a calendar of every Saturday in February, March, and April. So I had like 12 dates or whatever, and I've just been slowly filling in the pieces. So once you get a, a, a venue to lock in, then you find a, a local band that's from that area, ask them if they want to play. If they say yeah, or if they say no, then you ask, okay, who else in that area is worth asking that can draw, you know? And... 
I started off by asking bands that I'm friends with, but <laughs> that honestly didn't lead anywhere. Like I knew a bunch of bands from out of states that we're friends with, but they're all busy or whatever. Yeah. A couple of them are, are, are like, there's this one band cheer up dusty. They're from, uh, like Philly area, they're hopping on a show. But the problem with that show is I'm looking for a venue still. So I, <laughs> it's there's always a problem with something. But so once you find that one band and then whatever, then you got to find the rest of the bands. You ask them off, they're down, and then boom, it's locked in. So I've locked in all but four dates so far out of the 12. So yeah. I just got four more to get done. You'll get it done because it has to get done, dude. It will, yeah. And we still got a couple months to do it. And then, so we're gonna be, we're not going to be playing any shows locally for those three months. And then we're doing a... Big 420 house party show. Oh, awesome. Out here? In Milford. Oh, amazing, yeah, dude. Same, so the same house that we played this house show a couple months ago, it was a huge, huge turnout. There was like 70 people there, and like everybody was moshing. It was the biggest, funnest show. Not the biggest show, but like the, one of the funnest shows we ever played. It was just in this garage, packed packed house. It was so much fun. So we're going to do the same thing, but on 420, so... Everyone should come out to that. <laughs> you did a short film, though, that you made it as you went along. Yeah, there was a short film I did where I played every character in it, and then I made it up as I was going along, yeah. yeah. It was all improv, and it was like, I forget how long it is, maybe 15 minutes or something. But that was mad fun. I literally That took a month to do every single day. Just like, I think that was during lockdown or something. No, I think it was before COVID. It was just a winter that I had nothing to do, <laughs> and I was just doing that. Like, usually every year I'll do, like, in January, I'll do a daily video every day. Or at least I did that the past two years. And I'll do a video every single day of January where I just, um, I don't have any ideas. I just wake up and try to make something up. And those have turned out mad fun because I end up with, like, 30 videos that I never would have made otherwise. Because without the challenge of having to come up with a video every day. The first week is usually pretty easy, but then, like... I'm literally stressing, like trying to be like, I can't break the streak. I need to come up with something dumb and fucking make this a stupid video. But that's like the funnest exercise. I wish I could, I need to do that with more things. I need to set like, you know, plan a whole month where I write a song every day or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that'd be pretty sick or paint every day, you know? Yeah. Cause that's one way just to get better too. Yeah. One thing I want to talk to you about too, because you're really good with marketing and promo, dude, you know? Yeah. Social media is super important to this whole game, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do you prioritize that and you know, how do you create your content? Um, well, yeah, a lot of my best ideas, I literally, I come up with them like while I'm like, you know, when you're sleeping and like, you're about to wake up, but you're not up yet. You're still just like laying in bed for that last half hour, maybe an hour. Yeah. Well, you're kind of up and your, your brain's working, right? Yeah. That's when I come up with my best ideas. <laughs> so like whenever, I, like if, if it's like a month out from like a release, like a song or something, I'll be just you like my wheels will be turning every day, every morning. And I'll just be coming up with ideas that I need to make into videos so I'll, so a lot of times i wake up with like a, a good idea and i'll just shoot a, a promo then or whatever but i've just been doing it so much that i've learned what works and what, what doesn't and just like from doing graffiti and just like graffiti or uh, guerrilla marketing in that sense of just like painting your name out in public i feel like that like opened my mind in a way for marketing that other people might not have might not have yet. yeah because i've literally gone out and like just posted scooped up all over the place and made videos of that and shit and use that as like promo and whatever. And one of the funniest things that worked the best was I literally, when MGK was like blowing up for all this pop punk stuff, I literally made the website mgksucks.com. Amazing. And dude. made it our website. <laughs> and then I'm in this pop punk Facebook group that was like, it's, it's got thousands of followers or whatever, but I would always post my stuff in that. And during this whole MGK thing, literally every post was MGK this, like either I love MGK or oh fuck MGK is doing this now, I hate him. Like it was such a love hate relationship in this group. So when I posted mgksucks.com, like that's all I did. I literally just posted mgksucks.com as a post. It blew up in this Facebook group and we got like 8,000 website views from it. It was like the cheapest piece of marketing I've ever done. It was 15 bucks for the domain name, <laughs> but like thousands and thousands of new fans for that month or whatever it was that they were checking us out. And yeah, it was so sick and so funny. How do you think pop punk has changed as a whole since you started, though? A lot. When we started, there was like no pop punk resurgence. You know what I mean? Like the past couple of years, it's really made itself back into the mainstream like it was in the early 2000s. And that's kind of like why I started the band is like I grew up listening to pop punk and, and skate punk and whatever and just and skateboarding and shit that like it was like the soundtrack to my upbringing that when I got old enough to make it myself, I was like, it just was like obvious. I wasn't going to be a rapper, you know, like I just, like I had street cred or whatever from like what I would, what like from painting and shit or whatever, I could have been a rapper, but I just felt like it wasn't my thing, you know, and I was big into hip hop and rap, um, 
during high school, like 2009 to 2012 or whatever. And then I just really like checked out from it, from like all the mumble rap or whatever. Started going back into my roots of what I like listening to all the skate punk and shit that I used to grow up to. And then a couple of years later, that's when st- I picked up the guitar and that was the obvious thing I was going to play. So, um, yeah, what was the question? No, that was how <laughs> pop punk has changed. I think you oh, answered it. How did it change though? It fucking like when I, when we first started, there was bands like Knuckle Puck and like Story So Far where their flavor of pop punk is, was different than what I grew up to. Like the, like Blink-182 and like, uh, Sum 41 and shit of the early 2000s where it's very melodic and whatever, like. Uh, story so far and knuckle puck were very yelly in a way, you know, and, and like which I really like now, but it was just different, you know. I mean, it was more it was different than like singing cleanly on pop punk riffs. Like they're really like almost screaming, but like melodic screaming, and like you know, and that got me into a lot of melodic hardcore because of it, and it really kind of changed my mind on that. But we've always been our kind of flavor of pop punk is like the early 2000s, late 90s, like skate punk, where it's just really fast, but also really melodic. And so we kind of have been bringing that flavor since we started. And luckily for us, it's been making a comeback in the in the mainstream. Yeah. What's been a game-changing moment for Scooped Up? Did you have like a moment where you're like, oh, whoa, like this is happening right now? Uh, nothing crazy. I mean, probably the bowling for soup thing, but like every, it's been a bunch of just little game changing moments, just stacking up on top of each other. But like, like I said, when I first started, I just, just wanted to write songs that I could skate to. And then we started playing shows and like, we were so like different than any other band that we were playing with. Like we're super fast, but tight as shit and like very melodic and like, it was just a lot of fun. And, uh, fuck. I have the worst ADD. Dude, you're so good. You know, <laughs> uh, you know what I, we could talk about, too, to kind of, like, send this off, is that you have the album release show on the 13th of January. Yeah, that's going to be a big, big party. I hope, I plan, I advise everybody go to that. Uh, we're playing at Cafe 9. We played there a couple months ago, I think, yeah. And uh, it, we, like, almost sold the place out. So hopefully we're going to sell it out this time. And we'll have the vinyl available. We'll have new T-shirts, new merch, and a bunch of cool stuff. And that'll be our last local show before the tour, before the 420 show, whatever. So I'm hoping everyone's going to come out. It should be a big deal. Yeah, Yeah, dude. And if people are just finding you right now for the first time, you know, where can they find you? And Oh, just go to our websites. uh, Our our website. You go to mgksucks.com. You go to ibrokemydick.com. That's crazy. You can go to poopedup.com. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you can go to scoopedupband.com. It's all the same website, but that's the main one. Scoopedupband.com, I guess, is probably the... I don't think you'd want your uh, search history to say I broke my dick.com, but it does work. I thought it was the most absurd <laughs> website name, so we went with that. <laughs> that's like one of those websites that I feel like you could probably resell for a pretty penny, dude. Maybe, dude, mjksucks.com. I'm hoping that he's going to hit me up one day and be like, yo... This take, is genius. Take that down. Oh, Let me day. buy that or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like he'd be like, yo, relink it to mine. Yeah, relink it to mine. Yeah, whatever. But uh, no, you know, what's funny is scoopedup.com was taken and they wanted like $100,000 for it. What the fuck? Yeah. Was it an ice cream website? Like what was no, it? No, it was dude? nothing. They were expecting some oh, big ice cream company to come around and buy it though. Dog, I, I relate to this so heavy, dude. A magician <laughs> owns MikeSquires.com, dude. And Fucking Fender owns MikeSquires.com. I want to talk to you about the shoelace music video. I know that you guys shot that all on film. Yeah. So yeah, that was sick. It was our first, like, so I've always been shooting our uh, photography on film just because of how sick it looks. And I've always wanted to do like a video on film. And I've, it just seemed like something so far fetched and, and like always out of my budget or whatever. But over time, I, I like did more research on it. Ended up finding a film, a sixteen millimeter film camera that I bought once I had some money saved and stuff. And then I shot a short film on film to like test what it would be like and make sure I could even do it because it's a lot of fingers crossed. Hope we get it right. You know what I mean? You got to sit there and like you can barely even see what you're shooting, and then you can't see the film until it comes back after it gets developed and costs money and everything. But uh. So I made that short film I was talking about it a, a little bit ago where uh, I'm just like walking around and like narrating over it, just telling jokes and shit. And we might end up turning that into a music video, but that was the test to do anything on film uh, on 16. And it came out good. It came out exactly how I thought it would come out. So after that, I came up with the concept for Shoelace where it's just like following a pair of shoes after you buy them and just showing them get roughed up and going from a clean pair of Converse to, oh, I thought I had them on right now, to <laughs> a, a dirty pair of Converse and... 
it follows like a storyline where the dude like finds a flyer, goes to a show, meets a girl and gets laid and then throws the shoes into like a shoe tree, which literally at the, at our skate park, our local skate park, there's just a hundred shoes in this tree. So it was the perfect little set piece. Once I threw the, the shoes in there, it was just like a little, like, I don't know. It was a cool little symbolism of something. I don't fucking know, but it was cool. Um, but the grueling part of it was just like filming it all the time and not knowing what we're going to get back until we get it back and having to reshoot stuff or whatever. But most of it came out exactly how I planned. And that was like the test video for the next music video that we got coming out with the album. Oh yeah. I want to talk about that too, dude. Yeah. It's, uh, so the, the, the last single, well, it'll be releasing the day that the album comes out is, uh, it's called uh, Joyride, And that's going to be, we shot that on film and it revolves around, uh, this classic car that I've been like restoring and shit. And like, it's just us cruising around in this classic car and just like getting into mischief and stuff. I won't spoil any of it, but that's also shot on film. And that one's even sicker than shoelace. If you ask me, just cause there's more, it's more in this, in the, uh, it's more like best days in a way. Yeah. Like it's more in the theme of that where there's, we're like driving around and stuff's happening and there's like little things that happen that are cool. Yeah. No spoilers. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything, but like, it's very in the same vein of, that much of an ambitious video where it was a lot of like my friends holding the camera, but now it's a film camera outside their car following my car and stuff like that to get those out outer shots. And, and there's a sick climax at the end that we had to shoot twice that I'm not going to spoil, but you'll see the <laughs> sick ending to that whenever you see it. But yeah, that let's was, go, dude. But now I literally just want to shoot everything on film just because it has such a timeless look to it, but it's also a headache. So I might, you know, we're probably going to, I also have a very good uh, digital camera that we can that we did some of we did we shot best days on that one. Okay. So I could I still have you know a little bit of an arsenal of what we want we can pick and choose if we want to do digital or film. Yeah. But yeah, it was a lot of fun and I can't wait to release that. Yeah. So you know you got the album coming up, you got the tour coming up, you got all these videos, you got the shows. You know what's next for Scooped Up, dude? Like what do you what do you see a year from now looking like for you guys? Well, my plan is to release another project a year from now. Cause oh, amazing. Th this took four years that I want to just fucking put shit out. And I already have six songs written for the next project. So Ahead of the game, dude. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I could say that when we when we released our last EP, which was in 2019, we had like three of these songs already written. So I thought I was ahead of the game then. But uh, <laughs> this time I think we're, we're planning, I don't know how many we're planning to do, but maybe like eight songs. It depends on how many songs. If we end up doing like maybe just a four song EP. Some of these songs aren't going to make it, but like I have two songs out of the six that are like really good on par with like, uh, the, or, or better than all of our singles. Like they're our, our next big thing. One of them is called Don't Wipe. We've been playing that one live for a, for a couple of weeks. Incredible or a couple name, months, I mean. Dude. But yeah, we were going to name the album Don't Wipe, but like, <laughs> <laughs> and we thought it was too dumb. But uh, so that song, we've been playing that and that one's really good. And then I'm just trying to make, write songs that are up to par with that. And we have like, a good couple of contenders now. So I think hopefully by next year we'll either be releasing or we'll be like talking about releasing an, like an EP around that time. So uh, awesome, definitely dude. 2025, I'd, I'd say. I'm, a, I'm excited to keep following the journey, dude. And if people wanted to connect with you and find Scooped Up, how could they do that? Oh, just go to scoopedupband.com or go to Scooped Up on Instagram um, or YouTube or Spotify. You can find us everywhere. Just Google Scooped Up. We, we lucked out and no, nothing, there's nothing except for, I guess, ice cream places that have that name. So we come right up. <laughs> Let's go, dude. I yeah. appreciate you coming on the pod, man. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me, man. I want to share with you guys my thought of the day, and that's this. You can do it yourself. You don't need to rely on other people. If you want to get merch made, you could print it yourself. If you want to get your cover arts done, you can do it yourself. And if you're trying to shoot a music video, you can do it yourself. And this doesn't just apply to artists and music. This applies to a lot of things in life. Don't wait for the opportunity to come and knock because it might never come. Don't wait for the opportunity to come to you. You got to go out and get it. So go out there, get it, and make it happen. And as always, guys, there's one thing you got to do. You got to believe before the world does.